Okay, we begin with the salutation to the Buddha this time. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Today we have this especially big class, we're combining two classes into one, both the teacher training class and my super study class. So it's, I hope everybody is comfortable with it. Okay, we've been studying Sutta number 39 in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is called the Maha Asapura Sutta. And this sutta is especially valuable because it gives a kind of thorough overview of the classical training of the Buddhist monk from the early stage up to the point of liberation. And so last time we covered roughly the first half of the sutta, but I can just do a brief review of what we covered. So in the sutta, the Buddha is instructing the monks that they should live up to the designation by which they refer to themselves and by which others know them. This is in Pali, the word is samana, which is translated as recluse, somewhat inaccurately because the word recluse suggests somebody who lives completely isolated from society, whereas a Buddhist monk lives in a very close relationship with the lay community. But the word samana originally comes from the Sanskrit word shramana, which is based on the root shram, verbal root shram, which means to work, to strive, to undertake labor. And so this word was used to designate those who had renounced the household life went into homelessness and undertook the special efforts, special striving in order to realize what was considered the ultimate good, the highest goal in the Indian religious scene, the attainment of moksha, liberation, sambodhi, enlightenment, nirvana, nibbana. And so this is how the Buddhist monks came to be known on the wider Indian scene. People called them Samana. Even the Buddha himself was called Samana Gotama, the recluse or the ascetic Gotama. And so the Buddha is instructing the monks that they should live up to this designation. And so he wants to now, now he wants to explain to them what are the things that make one a true samana, a true ascetic, a true monastic person, a true recluse? And so he starts the discourse with, at the very base of the path, with the two qualities which are called shame and fear of wrongdoing. What is called shame is hiri in Pali, and the fear of wrongdoing is otapa. translated as shame, this translation is not so completely satisfactory. 
but the word hiri refers to what I call the sense, the inner sense of self-respect or the inner sense of one's own dignity, the dignity of one's character that protects one from engaging in any unwholesome actions. So it's a kind of internal monitor of one's behavior that restrains one from wrongdoing. The other quality, the twin quality that goes along with it, otapa, is the fear of consequences, the consequences of wrongdoing. The fear of being blamed and criticized by others, the fear of punishment, perhaps by the authorities, and also the fear in accordance with the law of karma, the law of karma cause and effect, the fear of creating unwholesome karma that will lead to suffering in future lives. Okay, so based on this sense of shame or self-respect and the fear of wrongdoing, these, the Buddha says, are the two roots of morality. Then based on these two roots of the moral life, the ethical life, come three factors that constitute the ethical life. Actually, four factors. So the first is, this is in paragraph four of the sutta, purified bodily conduct. So one's conduct of body should be purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained. Then the next is verbal conduct, conduct of speech, which should also be purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained. And then third comes mental conduct, one's thoughts, one's intentions. Those should also be purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained. And then the fourth factor of the ethical life is right livelihood. So even in the case of the monastics, the Buddha says, our livelihood shall be purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained. And in the case of monastic, this doesn't mean that <laughs> the monk or nun is working at a, a respectable job within society, but this refers to the way in which they obtain the requisites, the material requisites. They shouldn't obtain them by cheating others, by performing like superstitious rites for others, by trying to deceive others, um, in any kind of way which is considered unscrupulous. But one lives in dependence on the kindness, the generosity of others, and in the Indian society, as well as in contemporary South Asian society, the lay people are always very happy to support well-disciplined monastics. Okay, so these four constitute the ethical life, and now we come into certain intermediate factors of training, which form a kind of bridge from the ethical life to the development of the mind, to the development of the higher consciousness. So the first of these, this is in paragraph 8 of the sutta, is restraint of the senses. So one restrains the sense faculties so that when one sees any form with the eye, hears sounds, smells odors, tastes different flavors and so on, one doesn't grasp upon the object, but one trains the mind so that in the midst of perception one is without greed for pleasant objects and repulsion or aversion towards disagreeable or unpleasant objects. Okay, along with restraint of the senses comes moderation in eating, so that in order to have the body in a fit condition for the meditative life, one should not eat too much or too little. 
if one eats too little by undertaking long fasts, then the body can become weak, unfit for the practice of meditation. If one eats too much, then the body becomes dull and sluggish and heavy, and again it becomes difficult to do meditation. So what the Buddha teaches is one should practice, is called in Pali, bojane matanyuta, which means knowing the right amount in regard to food. So one eats just enough to sustain oneself, keep oneself in good health, to end discomfort and to support the spiritual life. Then we come to the next factor, and this is called wakefulness. And that means that this is for the earnest meditator. During the day, he passes his day sitting in meditation, walking, doing the walking meditation, alternating sitting and walking meditation. During the first part of the night, again, continues sitting, walking, sitting, walking. In the middle part of the night, perhaps for four or five hours, he'll lie down mindfully and sleep, then wake up in the early morning and again begin with the sitting meditation, the walking meditation. So this is wakefulness or vigilance. And this goes along with the next factor, which is called mindfulness and full awareness, or I prefer now mindfulness and clear comprehension. In Pali, this is sati and sampajanya. So sati is what was is what is usually translated as mindfulness, and sampajanya, venerable Nyanamoli, translated full awareness, which I don't particularly like, though I, I left it in this translation. Now I prefer clear comprehension. So sati, we could say, is presence of mind, Keep, be, keeping one's attention on what one is doing being mindful of whatever is one is doing, keeping one's oneself under observation in all the activities of day-to-day -day life. And then clear comprehension means knowing what one is doing, knowing the purpose of one's action, knowing how one is going about achieving one's purpose, having a clear comprehension of the activity in which one is engaged. And so the Buddha says that you should train thus, we will be possessed of mindfulness and clear comprehension. We will act with clear comprehension when going forward and returning, when looking ahead and looking aside, when bending and stretching the limbs, when wearing our robes and carrying the outer robe and the arms bowl, when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, when going to the toilet, when defecating and urinating, when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent, in all these conditions one acts with clear comprehension. Okay, so this is the point that we ended last week, and now we continue. I'm still in the same paragraph on page 366. In each case, the Buddha is joining each new factor that he's introduced to the previous ones, and then telling the monks that that much is not enough. So here he says, I'm about the fourth line down, now, O oh monks, you may think thus, we are possessed 
of shame and fear of wrongdoing, our bodily conduct, verbal conduct, mental conduct and livelihood have been purified. We guard the doors of our sense faculties. We are moderate in eating. We are devoted to wakefulness and we are possessed of mindfulness and clear comprehension. That much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of the ascetic life has been reached. There is nothing more for us to do, and you may rest content with that much. But I inform you, I declare to you, O monks, you who seek the status of ascetics, do not fall short of the goal of the ascetic life while there is more to be done. So now the Buddha is going to explain what more has to be done and this is going to be stated by way of overcoming the five hindrances. The five hindrances are the main obstacles to the development of meditation. Okay, so here the Buddha says, now I'm in paragraph 12, what more is to be done? Here a monk resorts to a secluded dwelling place. And then the Buddha mentions what are the ideal dwelling places for meditation. The forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, or a heap of straw. So in the Buddha's day, monks didn't live usually in nicely constructed monasteries with all the provisions, electricity, <laughs> radios, <laughs> televisions, computer outlets. But they would live in very simple huts. And during the day when they would wanted to go for meditation, they would usually just choose the foot of a tree or open space or sometimes just a cave or an overhanging rock. They would sit under the overhanging rock and that would suffice for the whole day. Okay, so now the Buddha explains how the monk practices to overcome the five hindrances. Okay, so on returning from his alms round after the meal, he sits down, crosses his legs, holds the body erect, and establishes mindfulness in front of him. Then, abandoning covetousness or craving for the world, he abides with a mind free from craving. He purifies his mind from craving or sensual desire. Abandoning ill will, that's the first hindrance, by the way. The hindrance here is called covetousness, but it really signifies what is elsewhere called sensual desire. Then abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. But then he purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth and torpor, or dullness and drowsiness, he abides free from dullness and drowsiness, perceiving light, mindful and clearly comprehending. He purifies his mind from dullness and drowsiness. Abandoning restlessness and remorse, he abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful, inwardly calm. He purifies his mind from restlessness and remorse. Abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states or wholesome qualities. He purifies his mind from doubt. Okay, so here, very concisely, the Buddha indicates how the meditator overcomes the five hindrances. And if you just read the text, 
it seems that all you have to do is sit down, cross your legs, and start to meditate, and immediately one can get rid of the five hindrances. But actually, for perhaps in the Buddha's day, there were many people with, we say that they had planted seeds in previous lives through the intensive practice of meditation, life after life, And so when the Buddha arose in the world, these people also came to rebirth in the environment of the Buddha. And so after hearing the Buddha's teaching, they can go off and meditate and achieve success very quickly and easily. But maybe there are some of you who are like that. (laughs) But, well, for people slow, I include myself among them, most of our practice is dealing with the five hindrances, learning how to face them, how to understand them, and how to counteract them using different skillful methods of practice. Jason? Wayo shui itian? Wayao shui itian? Not yo (laughs) yao. Okay, so on one of the sheets that I handed out, (laughs) I have a kind of detailed analysis of the five hindrances. And looking at various suttas that come in the Nikayas, we see that the texts deal in quite elaborate detail with how the hindrances arise and what are the most effective remedies or antidotes? Thank you. What are the most effective antidotes to the five hindrances? Mm-hmm. So this guy here, he's my <laughs> perfect meditator. He sits down and not a thought in his mind. <laughs> Just frees his mind from thoughts. I'm just thinking of nuts, Bonte. I'm thinking of nuts. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're, you're misunderstanding me. I came back with Ponte from California. I used to work 20 years in the computer business. <laughs> then I got wary of the world. So when I met Bhante, I, I asked him to ordain me. <laughs> I got ordained. And now I'm a chipmunk. <laughs> You know, Bhante says he's a slow meditator. I don't have any problem with the five hindrances. <laughs> Just sit down, focus on my breath, and the thoughts all gone. <laughs> Maybe when we get back to the Taisho Hall, you can teach me a little bit how you do that. Very simple, Bhante. <laughs> Your problem, you read too many books. (laughs) (laughs) You Westerners, you just think too much. (laughs) So you sit down, you try to impress everybody. But I know you're just thinking, (laughs) dreaming of this, dreaming of that, angry with this one, angry with that one. I'm not angry with anyone. (laughs) I never get lazy, never get dull and drowsy. When I'm tired, I sleep. When I'm hungry, I eat. The rest of the time, I just meditate. (laughs) Okay, you 
you behave yourself and don't get off the class. <laughs> okay, comic <laughs> into the mood is Okay, so if we look at the table, we see the first hindrance is given as sensual desire. And then some of the suttas explain how sensual desire arises, and it arises from what is called careless attention to an attractive object. The word careless attention is very important word. This word is opposite. Very important. Okay, so what's called careless attention, this is a yoni so manasikara. Also, it might be rendered as superficial attention, unmethodical attention, improper attention. So, when one encounters an attractive object of the senses, then if one doesn't attend to it properly, if one attends to it carelessly, which means grasping upon the attractive features of the object, the sort of sensually enticing features of the object, of anything seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched, then the desire or craving arises for that object. So that is how sensual desire arises. And of course, in the context of Buddhist meditation, usually the most sort of stubborn, persistent, obsessive form of sensual desire is sexual desire. So thinking about, for the monk, thinking about beautiful, <laughs> beautiful women, about sexual pleasure. I don't know, maybe I think with women... I don't know the psychology, <laughs> but, but <laughs> maybe it's not so sensually rooted, but more rooted in terms of a kind of emotional fulfillment. At least that's what I've read in some of the psychological studies. But it could be a kind of longing, feeling of emotional unfulfillment if a woman is leading a monastic life. Okay, so... The texts propose some of the antidotes for overcoming sensual desire. And so, to begin with, the kind of provisional remedies is guarding the senses, that is, exercising restraint over the senses, and being moderate in eating, because if one just allows oneself to eat anything that one is attracted to, and if one overeats, then that will provoke sensual desire. But then the special meditative object for counteracting sensual desire is what is called careful attention, that is yoniso manasikara, thorough attention, deep attention, proper attention to an unattractive object, what is called the asubha nimitta. And what is meant by the unattractive object usually is taking one's own body and then analyzing or investigating one's own body in terms of the classical 32 parts of the body. So one investigates 
one's own body from the top of the head down to the feet, from the feet, the bottom of the feet up to the top of the head, bounded by skin. One investigates the body in terms of the 32 parts, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, then beneath the skin. Actually, when one sees the body, any body, if you really reflect, what are you actually seeing? You know, the most beautiful supermodel in the world, most beautiful actress, most handsome actor. When you look, what are you actually seeing? What you actually see with the eyes are hair of the head. You might see some hair of the body. You might see fingernails or toenails. If they smile, you see the teeth and you see the skin. That's all you're seeing. <laughs> and then you <laughs> imagine that the hair is cut off, put on the table in front of you. Some of the body hair is shaved off, put in front of you. The fingernails are clipped. The clippings of the fingernails are put in front of you. <laughs> Some of the teeth are pulled out, <laughs> or all of them are pulled out in front of, in front of you. <laughs> and maybe some of the skin pel peels off, you know, when somebody gets sunburned, the skin will peel off. Put the skin in front of you, <laughs> and then you ask yourself, <laughs> is this what I'm swooning over? <laughs> And so if you just focus on these five bodily parts put on a tray in front of you, all of that obsession and infatuation and intoxication <laughs> goes away. <laughs> okay, but then we can go beneath the skin to see what is actually below the surface. Then we get the muscles, nerves, bone, both the marrow of the bone, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, large intestine, small intestine, stomach, then inside the intestines there's the feces, in the head the brain, then there are the liquids or fluids of the body, <coughs> Bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, tears, the okay, tears, synovial fluid, that's the fluid of the joints, uh, saliva, mucus, the oil of the skin, and urine. So those are the 32 parts of the body. So if we what one does meditatively is to go through the body, starting with one's own body, in terms of these 32 parts, investigating them over and over. And as one does this, then one gets this impression of what is called the unattractive nature of the body. And that helps to diminish sensual desire. Okay, then to show the nature of sensual desire in the sutta, the sutta, the Buddha gives a simile. Now I'm in paragraph 14. The similes come in the paragraph 14. Suppose a man were to take a loan and undertake business, and his business were to succeed so that he could repay all the money of the old loan, and there would remain enough extra to maintain a wife, then on considering this he would be glad and full of joy. So this indicates the nature of the mind when one becomes free of sensual desire. To When the mind is overcome by sensual desire, that is considered to be like being in debt to another person. But when one is free of sensual desire, that is like repaying the loan and being free of debt. 
Okay, so that is the special method for overcoming sensual desire. Normally what is said is that one chooses a principal meditation subject. So this could be something quite neutral like the awareness of the breath, just attending to the in and out breathing. But sometimes for a person, as they go on concentrating on the, trying to concentrate on the breath, the mind gets overrun by sensual thoughts. And so when this happens initially, it said, one just becomes aware of the thought, drops it, and goes back to the main meditation subject, the breath. <clears throat> but if one observes that the mind is repeatedly getting obsessed by sensual thoughts, then for a time being one can put aside one's main meditation subject and temporarily take up the meditation on the parts of the body, the 32 parts of the body. Going through, there's a standard list to get familiar with them. It's not enough just to read the list, but one has to get some idea of what these parts look like. It's a little difficult nowadays. In the Buddhist time, the monks used to go to the charnel grounds where bodies were discarded, and then the crows and other birds would come and tear open the bodies, and so they would be able to investigate what's inside the body. When I was living in Sri Lanka, we used to have like special arrangements with... You see, since Sri Lanka is a predominantly Buddhist country, many of the medical doctors, most of them are Buddhist, and so we used to cultivate special relationships with the doctors who would... Um, they would be the judicial forensic specialists whose job is to perform the autopsies. <laughs> and so sometimes we would go to the hospital and get special permission to go into the autopsy room and then the doctor would they'd bring out the corpse and I don't know if you've ever seen a corpse not decked up in a in a funeral home, but this is a corpse actually laid out completely naked in the mortuary. It looks just like a person who's sleeping, but then the doctor will take the scalpel and start cutting it open, and <laughs> you want to call out, don't do that to him! <laughs> he's still alive, but as he's cutting, there's no reaction, then he'll open up the body, I'm not going to horrify anybody. <laughs> and start pulling out different organs, telling us this is the, the heart, this is the liver, here's the small intestines, this, these are the large intestines, this is the spleen. And, you know, these are things we never normally see. And it's quite, um, well, very valuable to see the inside parts of the body. So then we, one gets an image of these parts that one could use for this, the practice of this meditation. Yeah, okay, so... One takes the 32 parts, so one puts aside the main meditation subject and focuses on the 32 parts, going through them over and over till one gets a very strong and clear impression of this unsatisfactory, unattractive nature of the body. And then when the sensual desire diminishes, then one can go back to the primary meditation subject, like the breath. Okay, now we come to the second of the five hindrances. This is ill will, or anger, or hatred. And this is said to arise from careless attention to a repugnant object, to something which is undesirable, disagreeable, unpleasant. Usually ill will arises towards people towards whom one feels some kind of aversion. And so if there's a person who see, whose manner seems gruff and crude, 
their speech is grating and offensive. Um, they have a kind of rough manner. They create all sorts of trouble for you. And if you keep on focusing upon them and upon the way they behave, the way they speak, the way they look, then ill will arises towards, towards one. Okay, so how does one overcome this ill will? So the main method that the Buddha teaches for overcoming ill will is the meditation on loving kindness. This is what we call in Pali metta, metta bhavana. Of the, the Pali words here, like for Kama Chanda, and yeah, yeah, I'm okay. never sure. So. Yeah, it's actually Kama Chanda. Thank you. Yeah, the Kama. A with the bar over it has it's a long vowel. Kama Chanda. Then the next one is ill will is Bia Pada. Bia Pada. Yeah, Bia Pada, and its condition is Patiga Nimitta. I should have actually asked, after explaining the first hindrance, whether there were any questions about the overcoming of central desire. Uh, how does that reconcile with the view of precious yeah, it's, How does that reconcile with the view of precious human life? Okay. I mean, human life is regarded as... I'll, I'll just repeat the question so that it gets onto the tapes. Um, she asks how to reconcile this view of the human body with the idea of the precious human life. Yeah, human life is considered precious, according to Buddhism, because it provides the special conditions, almost the unique conditions, for setting out on the path to liberation. Um, human life has the advantage of... It's said that it's not too short. It's not too long so that we become deluded by the length of the life, and yet it's not too short, so it's long enough for us to do, to undertake a process of spiritual development. There's a mixture of happiness and suffering in the human realm, so that through the suffering we can get motivated to undertake the practice of Dhamma, and because there's happiness, we can make progress and experience the fruits of practice. So for this reason, human life is pleasant, or it's considered something very precious and desirable. But this is, I say, the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body is something being used like a skillful device in order to overcome the craving for sensual pleasure. And I should also point out that, according to the meditation manuals, it is not recommended for everybody. For per People have different temperaments, and so for the person who tends to be angry or hateful, don't recommend the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body. For a person who tends to be morose and gloomy, it shouldn't be practiced but it's recommended especially for the person with strong sensual streak in their character, because that is the appropriate medicine. Yes, please. Um, I don't know if I can quite formulate this. Just try it, yeah. Okay. Um, talking about sensual desire in monks yeah. as usually focusing toward the sexual. Yeah. Whereas uh, psychologically in nuns and women yeah. there is a whole range of emotional components. Yeah. Yeah. Now traditionally have there been meditation practices mm. analogous to the 32 parts yeah. that deal with the articulation of the complexities of the emotional yeah, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> and I have to say that 
it's something I haven't really seen yeah. treated adequately in the Buddhist texts. Yes. One would have to say, quite frankly, that there seems to be almost a simplification of what you call this broad range of emotions, as if all the emotions of, say, of the household life, a feeling of, well, maybe there is something of... Because the texts sometimes speak about different emotions which are similar, but still they display subtle differences. So the text, they distinguish between sensual desire or sensual craving, which is sometimes called raga, translated as lust. Then there's an emotion called pema. Pema is affection. So this would be the kind of emotional attachment to another person, not necessarily just rooted in sensuality, but it's um, based on the kind of affinity of character, admiration for the person's personal traits. And the Pema can both be, have an attachment connected to it, and also there's a kind of Pema which is not connected with attachment. This would be, especially with good or very virtuous people, they will have an affinity, a resonance with one another, and an affection and admiration for one another, which is not based on a kind of craving or need within the person, but an admiration for what is good. Okay, so there's raga, which is sensual craving. There's pema, affection with attachment, and pema without attachment. And then there's metta, which is a kind of universal loving kindness. So, are there in the text yeah. strategies for dealing with pema with attachment? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything laid out quite like this scheme. Okay. But what I would say is that. <laughs> This is again, it's a little strong medicine, but it could be something like the meditation on death, that I have to be, yeah, maybe this is the one. It's a reflection that I have to be parted and separated from everyone and everything that is near and dear to myself. And so, um, when one practices this, even if one is, continues to live in you know, close association. It doesn't mean that one renounces and becomes a monk or a nun, but one continues to live with husband, wife, children, and so on. But if one of them dies, one can accept it with some degree of, of mental balance, not getting over, overpowered by emotion, because one has trained the mind to reflect that there must be separation. Whenever there's union or meeting, there must be eventual separation. Okay, doesn't chapter 20 have a lot of, you know, antidotes as to in the Majjhima Nikaya? Sutta number 20. Yes. Yeah, actually, Sutta number 20... The Tathara from Tahana Sutta. Yeah. It doesn't actually mention the specific antidotes, but what it says is that when unskillful or unwholesome thoughts arise, then one should overcome them by applying the appropriate opposite type of thought. Yeah. But I think the sutta itself doesn't uh, specify what those opposites are yeah. that we get from other suttas and from the commentaries. Okay, there are a few questions from the internet. One says, moderation and eating means that no self-respecting Buddha can become fat <laughs> like the fat Buddha in the Chinese temples. <laughs> Maybe. I'm puzzled. How would you answer that? Yeah. <laughs>
Well, actually, <laughs> that figure in the Chinese temples, he ain't really a Buddha. <laughs> That's actually Maitreya Bodhisattva. And you see, there was Chinese belief that somebody who's happy eats a lot, right? <laughs> when they eat a lot, they get fat. <laughs> That's why they show Maitreya Bodhisattva, he's going to be the next Buddha. And so he's very happy. Since he's happy, he eats a lot and he gets fat. Right, Bhante? I don't know, but maybe some of our. Um, <laughs> is that the explanation? <laughs> Okay, second question. <laughs> what is the meaning of recipient of light? Okay, that I'll come to as we go on. A super meditation, that's the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body, is it similar to aversion therapy and conditioning to cure some forms of addiction? Maybe, I don't know what aversion therapy is. Okay, unskillful practice of a Subha meditation led some monks to commit suicide. So is it safe to practice without supervision by an experienced teacher? Yeah, there's an account that comes in the Vinaya, also in one of the suttas, that it's a very strange incident. The Buddha taught the Subha meditation, the meditation on the impure, unattractive nature of the body, then he went off immediately after into isolated meditation. Was it for two weeks or three months? I don't remember. But he's not available. Then these monks are practicing the Subha meditation and they become revolted by the body and so they start killing one another or asking some other person to kill them. And so when the Buddha comes out of meditation and looks at the Sangha, He's wondering, where have all the monks gone? <laughs> then Ananda reports they've all, well, not all, but many of them have committed suicide. Then the Buddha says they didn't practice skillfully. Then he teaches mindfulness of meditation. I have to say that incident seems so strange to me because like any skillful med meditation teacher knows that if one teaches the Asuba meditation as a full-time meditation, one shouldn't just abandon the new practitioners to their own devices, but one should be available for consultation. So how could the Buddha go into seclusion right after teaching that? And wasn't Sar Venerable Sariputta around also? That's, what, that's also and another... I can't imagine Venerable Ananda or Venerable Sariputta who knew what they were doing. Would ever, it just doesn't ring right. To, to yeah, that's, a, that's also the, the other thing that occurred to me. Even if the Buddha went into seclusion, there would have been other advanced monks around to give advice, like Sariputta, Moggallana, Ananda, Mahakasapa. What about precepts? About killing. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, this forms the background, strangely, if I remember, for the Buddha to also lay down the rule, the Vinaya rule, against taking a human life. Maybe it's exposition, you know, from a later read after. It seems, I get the impression that that's the case. So, but one thing that is true, what I said earlier, that the Asuba meditation on the body, it's not recommended for those who have a kind of morose or depressive person, who have a morose or gloomy personality or who are subject to depression. But it's for those who are more of a hot, excitable, um, sensual, those with a sensual temperament. And initially it should be practiced under conditions where one can consult an experienced teacher. But if one has practiced meditation for a long time with other subjects, and you just do short periods of the Asuba meditation, it's all right. I don't think that will prove dangerous. Okay, any other questions from the people here? I have a question. 
I have a question about the first hindrance. Yeah. It's translated as uh, covetousness to yeah. the world in the textbook. Yeah. It's sensual pleasure. In yeah. The adult, yeah. I saw there are different translations, but then I find out in Pali there are different words. Yeah, there are actually different words in Pali. Synonyms, because I wouldn't think you would use a super meditation to remedy a uh, covetous. Yeah. Yeah, okay, this is an interesting point. The Pali word that occurs in the explanation of the first hindrance in paragraph 13, it's translated covetousness, it's abhijja. And often that means any kind of craving. But then when the text, other texts enumerate the five hindrances, they use the word kamachanda, which specifically means sensual desire. So we can understand that the word abhija, or English covetousness, can take on different meanings in different contexts. So as the first hindrance, it seems, it could, maybe it has both a narrow meaning as sensual desire, and also a broader meaning as any kind of craving. So somebody, say, who had come from a wealthy family, and entered upon the monastic life, might start thinking about how comfortable and easy his life was when he was living amidst the luxuries of his wealth, without being obsessed by specific sensual thoughts. Isn't Abhijja usually translated as ignorance? No, that is, that is Abhijja. Abhijja. This, this is Abhijja. Oh, Abhijja. Abhijja, a different word. Because I got really confused. Okay, I will go on now to the next hindrance. This is ill will. Okay, ill will, as I explained, is anger, hatred, which arises from careless attention to something disagreeable, unpleasant, or repugnant. And so the remedy for this is the, what's called the liberation of the mind through loving-kindness or the meditation on metta, metta-bhavana. And so to develop this meditation, again, the texts work out a particular strategy or method. They explain that one develops loving-kindness towards people representing different groups, first to oneself, then towards a dear and respected person, then to a close friend, then to a neutral person, and then finally to a hostile person. After one masters, or after one becomes skilled in developing loving-kindness to all of these individuals, then one broadens the loving-kindness by generating it towards different geographical areas, then to the four or six directions, and then finally one is able to extend the loving-kindness to the whole world. So one then abides suffusing the whole world with the mind of loving-kindness. And so if somebody is trying to practice meditation, say on mindfulness of breathing, if some angry thoughts, resentful thoughts, thoughts of ill will arise, initially, at the beginning, one just notes them, lets them go, and tries to come back to the breath. But if you've been practicing for some time, and you notice like a strong tendency towards ill will in the character, regular thoughts of like anger, hatred arise, <laughs> <laughs> then you can temporarily put aside the mindfulness of breathing and develop the meditation on loving-kindness, working through it systematically. Or even what is good to do as a daily practice, say if you have, you're sitting for 50 minutes, you could do either at the beginning 10 minutes of loving-kindness meditation, or at the end, ten minutes of loving-kindness meditation. So, when you do the loving-kindness meditation, it helps to make the mind very soft, very gentle, very malleable. And so, 
it helps with the practice of any meditation subject. And then if you find this meditation subject sort of congenial to your character, you can just use it as your primary meditation subject. And it's a very joyful, very uplifting meditation. Okay, then coming to the simile, we have, now I'm on top of page 367, we take the case of a man who is afflicted, suffering, gravely ill, and his food doesn't agree with him, and his body has no strength. Okay, then later he recovers from his illness, and his food agrees with him, and his body gains its strength. And then when he considers this, then he becomes full of joy. So, here ill will is compared to an affliction, an illness. And being free from ill will is like recovering from the illness. Okay, so this is ill will. I'll finish all five uh, of the hindrances, then I'll ask for, for questions. Okay, the next third hindrance is called, here it's translated sloth and torpor, elsewhere it's translated dullness and drowsiness. So these are actually two different mental factors which are very closely associated. Dullness is like the heaviness of mind or rigidity of mind, so that the mind just can't focus, it gets... I compare it, this kind of mind, it's like the day when the sky is this gray, it's not raining, not distinct clouds in the sky, but the sky is just all over, it's like this leaden gray, and you get this heavy feeling in the body. That's like the dullness where the mind just is not malleable, not flexible, but very stuffy and dull. And after one is in this dull state for some time, even a few minutes, then one starts to get drowsy. This isn't the drowsiness that comes as the prelude to sleep at the end of the day, when you're starting to get really tired and sleepy. But even if you had a good night's sleep and you feel quite vigorous in the morning or in the afternoon, whatever, then you sit down to meditate and suddenly one starts to get drowsy, drowsy. <laughs> and then you're sleeping. Because you sometimes, maybe not falling into deep sleep, but there come these little moments where you seem to drift off into it kind of sleeping state. So that is the drowsiness. Okay, so then there are various antidotes to this dullness and drowsiness. And one of them mentioned here is called being percipient of light. Or the specific method is called the perception of light. This is Aloka Sanya in Pali. So to overcome this, what one does is, to overcome the dullness and drowsiness, one gets the image of a light. It could be from looking at the sun. Don't stare at the sun, but you can just look at the sun for a few seconds to get the image of the bright globe of the sun, or look at the full moon, or you could look at an electric light, especially one that's white light like this or even the flame of a candle. Don't stare at the light, but just look at it for 10 or 15 seconds just to get the image of the light. Then one visualizes that light 
with one's mind's eye and tries to see it becoming brighter and brighter. If one loses the image of the light, then one can look at the real light again for a few seconds, then close the eyes and see the light with one's mind's eye. And sometimes if one does this, then one gets a very clear and distinct impression of light in the mind, and that will dispel the dullness and drowsiness. But other texts mention some other methods of overcoming dullness and drowsiness. One of them is to do, to leave the sitting meditation and to do vigorous walking meditation, not the very slow walking meditation where you're lifting, pushing, putting down, pressing. Because if you're doing it very slowly, you can still get dull and drowsy and then think, why should I be walking? Let me sit down again. Why should I be sitting? I could meditate much better by lying down. But one walks vigorously, fairly quickly, just being aware of right step, left, right, left, right, left. And when one does this, then one arouses one's energy. And one could even keep up that walking meditation for a half an hour or even 45 minutes or an hour. Don't think that if one is walking, one isn't doing real meditation, that you could only do real meditation if you're sitting. There are many records in the texts of meditators who reach enlightenment through the walking meditation. Okay, then the fourth hindrance is the opposite of dullness and drowsiness. This is called Udacha Kukucha, restlessness and remorse. Restlessness means mental agitation, you know, just having constant thoughts flowing through the mind, random thoughts, agitated thoughts, worried thoughts. And then the other, it's its counterpart, remorse, means when one has done something wrong, especially transgressing one of the precepts, then sometimes the mind is constantly dwelling on the wrong that one has done, and one gets this kind of scratching in the mind. I shouldn't have done that, I should have done that. And that is a disturbance that prevents the mind from settling on its object. And so, what the texts say is that the actual standard text is not very helpful. It says simply, abandoning restlessness and remorse, he abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. And then the, the text, the other to say, one overcomes restlessness and remorse by careful attention to peace of mind. Again, it's... <laughs> not so helpful, it's easier said than done. But what other meditation teachers recommend is choosing a meditation subject that helps to focus the mind and then using a skillful device to keep one, to keep the mind connected to that meditation subject. So what they usually recommend is being mindful of breathing and counting the breaths from one to five or one to ten. And then when one gets to ten, then one goes back to one and counts up to ten again. If one loses track of the counting, one starts again at ten. And by using, setting oneself this task of counting the breaths, one keeps extremely attentive to the count and that helps to tie the mind to the breath and prevents it from wandering. So that is one method that the texts recommend, is mindfulness of breathing with counting of the breaths. But another method that I found on my own that is very useful 
to overcome restlessness and remorse is the meditation on the qualities of the Buddha. You can just take a nice, attractive Buddha image. You don't have to be able to visualize it like the Tibetan lamas, being able to see every detail, but just get the impression of the calm, peaceful, blissful, compassionate face and figure of the Buddha, and just turn over in the mind again and again the qualities of the Buddha. Can be whatever qualities appeal to you. We could say the peaceful one, the purified one, the wise one, or just think over the enlightened one, the enlightened one, the Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. Always keeping that inspiring and pure image of the Buddha in your mind's eye. And that will help all of these restless thoughts, worried thoughts, to settle down and the mind becomes calm and uplifted. Yeah. Yeah, their uh, restlessness and remorse are counted together because they both prevent single pointed concentration. But then the other two also, yeah. I'm wondering why when, you know, for, uh, how eradicated this restlessness, the path of our hunch, has been remorse, the path of the non returner, that is, since if they, if they really are uh, dealt with or eradicated at different points, then why are they considered together? Okay. All of the five factors here are obstacles to concentration, yeah. but dullness and drowsiness are joined because they are factors which, you could say, that pull the mind down, that drag the mind down, yeah. whereas restlessness and remorse are alike in causing agitation of the mind or disturbance of the mind. It's a sim in a, they function in a similar way, but there's a difference in tone between them. Okay, the fifth hindrance is doubt. And so, it's said that abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states or wholesome qualities. And then the text or the chart that I've made up explains what is the primary condition for doubt and it says careless attention to things that are a basis for doubt. Again, this isn't so self-evident, but what it means is not being able to distinguish properly what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, what is an obstacle to one's practice, what is of benefit to one's practice what should be cultivated, what should be abandoned. And so the primary antidote to doubt, well, one, anti one antidote that's recommended is said to be much learning, that is to study the Dharma so that one knows from consulting various texts what are the unwholesome qualities like the five hindrances, or the ten fetters, or the seven latent tendencies. And then what are the wholesome qualities, like the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right efforts, the five spiritual faculties. And so when one gets a good knowledge of the text, or has access to good teachers who could clear up what are obstacles, what are aids to the practice, then one will be able to overcome doubt and advance in the practice. But there are, I would distinguish between two kinds of doubt. One is doubt in the sense of having real questions about the teaching, and those are the questions that one should try to settle by either by study of the text or by going to a qualified teacher and discussing these questions and problems that one has. So those are genuine doubts or 
maybe you call them intellectual doubts. The second kind of doubt is what maybe we can call skeptical doubt, cynical doubt, or obsessive doubt. And I've noticed that certain people have these pro- this, this problem that they can never really settle their mind on the practice. But whenever they sit down to practice, questions just come into the mind and obsess them. And even if you answer a hundred questions of theirs, it'll be followed by the next hundred questions. And so this is the kind of person who... (laughs) thinks too much. (laughs) So what do you do with that kind of meditator? Venerable Chipananda? (laughs) Well, what I advise the person to do, just notice the doubt and drop the doubt. (laughs) Fang sha, fang sha. Drop it, drop it. Right? Let it go. If you're doubting, just note. Doubt, doubt. And just look into the mind that's doubting. Just observe the mind that's doubting. Good answer. (laughs) Yeah, if one has the problem with this kind of obsessive doubt, You can just watch the mind doubting. Just watch the way the mind is tying itself up in knots and tangles. And observing this can become a very interesting process. You get to understand, see, the subtle little tricks of the mind. That, you know, when you sit down to meditate, it's like these, all these little obstacles that have been sort of hiding behind the curtain of the mind now start coming out into the open and working and becoming active. And so if one just observes them, particularly this obsessive doubt, you just see it as a kind of mental activity. And after some time of observation, those doubts will start settling down, becoming quiet, and then the mind will settle down. Okay, any questions now on any of the five hindrances? Anything said? If you feel shy about asking me, we have a (laughs) very accomplished meditation master. Yeah, I wonder if Venerable Chipananda, what neighborhood from Brooklyn do you come from? I'm not from Brooklyn. Not from the Bronx. That's not. I'm from San Francisco, Golden Gate Park. No, you're not. Yes. I used to work in Silicon Valley and go back to live at night in the park. A more serious question, uh, or whichever Bonte. Yes. You know, a lot of these hindrances, it's really not that hard if you're sitting in meditation to just put them aside. Yeah. I can do that. But then when I'm in daily life, ill will and doubt, it's just me. Um, I don't really have sadha. I don't have anything. So it's just, so you can sit in your little room and push it aside and get into states and all that. Well, that's nice, but it doesn't do anything for real life necessarily. Do you understand what I'm saying? I understand what you're saying. What do you do? (laughs) <laughs> but you can apply when ill will arises in everyday life the antidote is not any different from the antidote in meditation um, you just apply the loving kindness that you develop in meditation you apply it to the situation of, of real life of everyday life so yeah, but you don't even have to necessarily apply it in meditation you just put it aside and meditate and concentrate on the breath. I see, I see. But what I would say is that if you have problems... <laughs> if you have problem with ill will in everyday life, then you can do the loving-kindness meditation as the sitting meditation. 
Has a phone. Don't roll the eyes. I could roll my eyes too. No, seriously, do it as a regular meditation practice. And that builds up what I would call the strength or power of loving kindness. So that, first of all, that when you build up that strength, then in everyday situations, the ill will doesn't arise so frequently or so strongly. And then if it does arise, then you could just bring the mind into the mode of the loving kindness meditation. And then one will overcome that right on the spot, the ill will through bringing up that mode of loving-kindness meditation in the midst of activity. Okay, okay that's with, with ill will, with doubt. I mean, if the doubt comes up in day-to-day -day life, write out the questions and... It's just when you reveal all this stuff and I, whenever studying yeah. revising. Well, if, when questions come up, that's good. That means that one is reading attentively and examining. That's what I would call the good kind, the investigative doubt. But the kind that is, that's the kind of doubt that leads to deeper understanding and to wisdom. But it's the, what I call the obsessive doubt, which is not really motivated by unclear understanding, but it's almost, I call it a trick or strategy of Mara, just to cause disturbance in the mind. spot meta meditation is pro for me probably more valuable than meta doing a, a formal meditation. Yeah. Yeah, but that could be true, but in order to build up what I would say to build up the force and skill in metta, it's helpful to do it as a formal meditation in the sitting in the sitting posture. Of course, if you have naturally a strong inclination to metta, then you might be able to bring it up right on the spot. But some people, I should say, some of us who started off with very <laughs> angry temperaments, very irritable temperaments, found it necessary to start practicing metta as a sitting meditation. Then we could bring it up in the midst of day-to-day -day activity. It's a concentration practice, so if one develops it in a sustained... Yeah, it's a very sweet, or joyful, or pleasant meditation. It doesn't go deep into the jhanas, though. There's only a certain level that... It says that it goes up to the third jhana. Well, if that's not deep enough, then... I've always read that, you know, like, Venerable Saraputs are really, really pushed. You want to get to the jhanas and the immaterial states, it's breath. You can do kasina, you can do metta, but yeah. really, the Venerable Saraputra really just said, you want to do it? Right. That was his recommendation. Yeah, but different people have different inclinations. Well, what if it works for you? The breath. Then do excite with it, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that you have to do metta. Yes? <coughs> Well, what's useful in the midst of activity to keep one's attention from wandering is the practice which was described earlier from page 365 to 66 is called mindfulness and clear comprehension. 
So that means when one engages in any activity, one keeps one's attention on that activity. So even if one is, say, walking through down the streets of Manhattan, one just can attend to the act of walking. Or even to keep the mind more focused, you keep special attention on the touch sensation on the feet as you go, as each foot presses on the ground. Of course, if you're walking through the streets of Manhattan, you have to have a wider attention than that. <laughs> if, you're, if you're just completely concentrated on the touch sensation of the feet on the ground, then you can get run over by a car or bump into <laughs> people. But to prevent the mind from wandering in too many different directions, you keep a kind of general awareness of the act of walking and with a little more specific focus on the touch of the feet. Or it could be anything that seems to, to anchor your mind. It could even be like on the whole form of the body as you're walking. And similarly, when engaged in any other kind of activity, make the effort to keep the attention on that activity, then the mind won't go wandering in different directions. Okay, we could take maybe one more question, then I think we'll have to stop. Okay, maybe we'll take two. First one here, then we'll take you next. But maybe it's better if you take this microphone. Concerning restlessness and remorse. Yeah. If a Christian had this difficulty and went to clergy, the answer would directly be look for self forgiveness, look for forgiveness. If a, that's not a response for the Buddhist to look for forgiveness for within yourself, to forgive yourself. Uh, yeah, okay, I say you're saying if a Christian if a Christian was yeah. had this problem. Yeah. I know of different methods that are suggested to overcome the sense of remorse. One is to do a kind of <laughs> this is actually develops later in Mahayana Buddhism is to do a kind of they call it in Chinese Chan Wei, kind of confession and feeling of remorse in front of the Buddha. And so one could do this almost on one's own in front of the Buddha, not like the Buddha is a real person or God in front of you, but it's just developing a particular psychological frame of mind. Because this is what people would do during the time of the Buddha. If somebody acted in a way which was offensive towards the Buddha, then later they realized that they had been behaving wrongly, then they would come to the Buddha and say, please, Bhante, uh, uh, I apologize for my behavior, please accept my apology. Then the Buddha would say, that is a sign of growth, of progress and development, that a person recognizes their wrong is wrong and makes amends, and makes them determined to behave rightly in the future. I'm not saying that that's particularly in a, an effective way, I was just wondering what the difference was. Oh, yeah, so this is one way would be to, in front of the Buddha, to sort of reveal one's fault, if it's something that's more serious, and then make a determination not to repeat it in the future. And then another sort of counteractive would be to do something good and wholesome as a way of counteracting the wrong that one has done. That's like good work, especially in Catholicism. <laughs> that's also recommended in Catholicism. Yeah, so this seems to be general principles of, of the religious life. Um, you sort of touched on this when you were talking about investigative doubt versus obsessive doubt. Yeah. Um, because I was reading in here where doubt is one of the hindrances, and then one of the other suttas, you know, the Buddha specifically says, you know, don't believe in this because I said it. You know, yeah. just because someone else said it. Yeah. Which also seems to be a form of doubt. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you can elaborate on the difference. Yeah. I think that sort of ties into that distinction I made between investigative doubt and obsessive doubt. And that's sutta actually before the Buddha makes that statement, he's speaking to the people called the Kalamas, and he says to them he says to the Kalamas, 
It is right for you to doubt. It is right for you to be perplexed. Doubt has arisen in you about matters that, um, that create doubt. Then he says, do not go by oral tradition, do not go by a lineage of teachers, do not go by hearsay, and so on. Yeah. So, in the case of investigative doubt, then that's the quite proper kind of doubt. But sometimes when one does an extensive investigation and all of one's doubts are resolved intellectually, but still these kind of obsessive questions come up, the way to deal with that is a meditative exercise is just to observe the doubting mind. And if it's really an intellectual doubt, you just make the note on a, after I come out from meditation, then I'm going to make some investigations about this point. But don't just keep on, you know, don't just go on sitting there thinking, is it this way, is it that way, why is this, what is this? Not useful. <laughs> okay, I think there's one internet question. Okay, so forgiveness is important to overcome remorse. Is there any specific Buddhist method to practice forgiveness? Actually, this is actually used within the Buddhist system. Um, often when one begins practicing the metta, loving-kindness meditation, one thinks to oneself, if I have done wrong to anyone in any way, in my mind, I ask them to forgive me, and if there is anyone who has done wrong to me, I forgive them. In this way, one, at least mentally, sort of resolves any kind of tensions, hang-ups, hassles that one has had with other people. Okay, I think we'll have to stop now, and um, we'll have to stop for the day. Yeah. Now, next week is November 27th. I think we can have a class next week. Are people tied down by Thanksgiving? Do people go away to... So it's all right. I used to think Thanksgiving weekend, don't have class. Everybody is gone to California. I want to go, I want to go, I want to go to California. <laughs> Everybody goes to California or to Florida. But maybe it isn't true. So we'll have the class to finish the sutta next week. Okay, so we end by sharing the merits. So I'm going to recite some verses to share the merits with the Dhamma protecting deities, the dragon spirits, the fierce spirits, and all other beings. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anumodipa chirang rakantu sasanam. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anumodipa chirang rakantu desanam. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anumodipa chirang rakantu mang parang he tavata cham he hi sampadang punya sampadang sabe devanumodantu sabe bhutanumodantu sabe satanumodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Bhavagupadaya Vichy Heta To E Tantare Satakayupa Panna Rupi Arupi Cha Asanya Sanino Dukha Pamuchantu Pusantu Nibuting Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> <laughs>
you, thank you, thank you everybody.